we're going to talk about dissociative disorders a little bit. Listen, when you dissociate, you're simply, as it says there, um, you disconnect from the media experience. So daydreaming is a form of dissociating. For those that uh, are unattentive, they're somewhere else in their minds. And we can be quite far gone in our dissociating states. Uh, daydreaming or coming up with a fantasy during, during regular waking hours, um, we can disconnect. The difference here is that when we're talking about a disorder, this involves a sudden loss of memory. Memory comes into play. You'll hear people talking about gaps in memory or they can go into many trances where a couple seconds later they'll say, what were we, were we talking about? They'll completely be lost or they, they can't account, or account for different gaps of period throughout their day. Um, and Chris Sizemore, you can see the picture here, Three Faces of Eve was a, it's a really good, uh, it's a really good book. It's also out there on uh, the movie. Um, Joanna Woodward played uh, Chris Sizemore, won a, uh, an Academy Award for a performance in that movie. Interesting and interestingly enough, she went on to play um, Sybil's therapist in the movie Sybil. Um, but anyways, it was the first documented case of uh, something called associative identity disorder, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, I'm going to move past this. You guys can read up on amnesia, um, dissociative amnesia, dissociative fugue. I want to talk about what was formerly called multiple personality disorder. It's now called dissociative identity disorder. Two or more distinct personalities of selves. Each has its own memories, behaviors, relationships. Um, one personality dominates at one time. And yeah, there seems to be, as it says here, a wall of amnesia that separates the personalities. They don't um, they don't have recollection of when the other one was present. When one retreat, retreats and the other becomes uh, the forefront personality, uh, the one that went behind or retreated to the back of the psyche doesn't have knowledge or memory of what took place. So they can go from from identity to identity, or sometimes um, we call them different um, different personalities or or different identities. Um, it says each identity has its own memories, behaviors, relationships. One identity dominates at one time and another takes over at another time. Individuals sometimes report a wall of amnesia. However, research suggests that memory does transfer across these identities, even if the person does not believe that it does. It's almost as if they're wanting to forget it. There's some memory that does or goes across that, which they'll sometimes deny. Um, exceptionally high rate of sexual or physical abuse in their history. Uh, majority are women. Maybe a genetic predisposition. Not everybody dissociates to this degree. Um, you can see United States of Terra is a Showtime uh, show. It's not. I don't think they make it anymore. You can watch it on Netflix though. It's really they do a good job. It's it's a it's a TV show, but it does a good job of helping you understand how um, she has to keep up with the different identities and how she uses her family members to help her um, remember who did what and who was in control. This is a controversial disorder because people, half of psychology believes it exists. The other people think that it's iatrogenic, that these people are basically um, coming up with these. It's, it's, it's doctor created or inborn um, that a person goes to therapy singular and then they come out with multiple personalities. So it's a social construct, um, social contagion. Um, these things explain it uh, a little bit uh, better. But some people believe it truly exists, um, and, I, and personally, I've worked with a few people that I believe um, one of them definitely had dissociative identity disorder, and her her eye color would change with personality. She would go from green to hazel to brown, and then back to hazel, and that was the tell. You could, you knew when she was switching personalities because her eye color would slightly change. Um, we used to record it and go back and watch it, and. Um, anyways, and she had, I think, six or seven personalities. It's not uncommon for them to have up to 15 or more. Some have 30 plus personalities. So it's interesting disorder. Um, a lot to be, uh, a lot still to learn, I guess you could say, about dissociative identity disorder. Schizophrenia, in my mind, is the most devastating or most difficult, I guess, um, psychiatric disorder. Characterized by highly disorganized thought processes, uh, chaotic to far removed. Um, there's positive and negative symptoms. The positive symptoms are marked by distortion or excess of normal functioning. Um, having hallucinations, uh, whether it's audible or, or visual hallucinations. Um, having delusional thinking, thoughts that are not based in reality. These are the positive symptoms. They don't sound good. No, it's just because it's, it's, the, it's the things we're observing, we're seeing, they're sharing with us. The negative symptoms, which can actually be more devastating, 
uh, social withdrawal, behavioral deficits, loss and decrease of normal functioning. Um, a lot of times there's a lack of motivation for wanting to do regular things in life. Um, it can be quite, quite difficult. Uh, it's usually diagnosed in uh, early 20s for men, mid 20s for women, but it can be diagnosed a little earlier, a little bit late. Uh, usually after 30, we don't see it being diagnosed very frequently. Uh, so most of, once an adults moved into their 30s and 40s, usually they're out of that concern time, I guess you could say, for schizophrenia um, manifesting. Um, the uh, hallucinations, sensory experiences, and absence of real stimuli, often hearing voices and sometimes multiple voices in their head. And some of the voices can be very distracting to them. Some of them can be saying some very harmful or negative things, hurtful things, or, or scary things. Uh, others report that some of the voices can be calming. And um, one individual I worked with, she said once um, the medication that she was using helped to uh, reduce the voices down to zero voices, she said she was kind of lonely. She actually kind of missed having uh, voices to conversate with, although she was happy she had relief from, from being distracted by them. Delusions, false, uh, unusual, or magical beliefs, uh, not part of the individual's culture. Yeah, I mean, it's it, you'll hear of somebody, you know, when I worked at inpatient, you guys, we always had, and I don't mind making, saying this in a, in a, in a, uh, a way to, to be uh, insensitive, but we always had a Jesus and we always had a, a, a Satan or a Lucifer. <laughs> and, and they actually got along on the, on the hospital unit. They played checkers together or something like that. Um, but, but to have this a delusion, a false belief that I am somebody, I'm Mother... Mother Teresa, I'm, I'm Joan of Arc. I'm, you know, um, and this is common. There's also a lot of uh, delusions about technology and um, conspiracy and um, believing that the, the aliens are going to invade or believing. Uh, so you have a lot of spiritual um, delusions. Uh, you have a lot of uh, magical or technology based delusions. And that seems to be pretty universal. We see that all over the world. Um, very tough. The thought disorders, unusual, sometimes bizarre thought processes. There's something called word salad, which is incoherent, loose word associations. Um, they make up their own unique words sometimes. Um, there's also disorders of movement, catatonia, a state of immobility, uh, unresponsiveness over time. You can see the person here on the right kind of posing in a way. It says unusual motor behaviors or positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Individuals may cause, may cease to move altogether, a state of catatonia. Um, sometimes holding bizarre postures. Yeah, and you can sometimes move them or sometimes they'll resist and won't let you move their, their arms about. Not that you want to do that, you know, but that's, you know, sometimes they'll hold it rigidly or sometimes they'll allow you to kind of move them about. Um, negative symptoms, flat affect, a little or no emotional display, lacking ability uh, to read other people's emotions. Cognitive symptoms, difficulty sustaining attention, problems holding information in memory, inability to interpret information, make decisions. These are the tough, tough symptoms, y'all, um, which which is kind of the downward um, trend and people moving in a direction that makes it hard for them to uh, maybe uh, be able to function in society. Um, some of the causes, uh, hereditary structural brain abnormalities. They have a small frontal cortex, sometimes in large ventricles. Um, Problems in neurotransmitter regulation. Uh, dopamine theory is is our best guess. We think there's heavy amounts of dopamine. Um, there's good evidence that dopamine plays a part in schizophrenia, causing the hallucinating, causing the delusional thinking. If you can use medications to help kind of reduce the dopamine levels or drop them and get them regulated, sometimes the voices will go away or the voices will, will at least get under control. Uh, the delusional thinking doesn't seem to be as strong um, when we can kind of control that dopamine level. So different different explanations here: sociocultural factors, socioeconomic levels, and other sociocultural factors. We think stress induces a lot of it. Uh, there's a lot of stress management in the treatment um, because stress seems to correlate with the onset of more delusional thinking and, and sometimes the, the the hallucinations themselves. So talking about personality a little bit, you guys. Um, chronic maladaptive cognitive behavioral patterns integrated into personality. And I'm going to talk about antisocial and borderline a little bit. Antisocial is not good, okay? When we say antisocial, anti we're talking, it's just not pro-social. Characterized by guiltlessness, law-breaking, exploitation of others, irresponsibility, and deceit. Um, some people even say it's synonymous with sociopathic. Um, there's a continuum there. It might start as antisocial and move into sociopath. But they, they, they have similar characteristics um, to a sociopath. And they're, in my opinion, the most dangerous um, 
listen, mental disorders, we don't need to fear people with mental disorders. We need to be very compassionate, and we're not at danger for the most part. Media sensationalizes, uh, and, and there's very uh, there are some situations, but they're rare. But with antisocial personality disorder, they are feeding off of our insecurities. They are trying to deceive us. They are con men. They are criminals. They are out to harm other people, and they lack remorse. They lack conscience. They lack feeling, uh, you know, a person's regular emotional experiences to them are just bizarre and strange. They're not able to go deep, and they um, they don't empathize. They lack a lot of empathy. They're not able to feel what somebody else's pain feels like. Um, they can fake all this. They can fake tears. They're very good at that. Um, you can see a picture here of uh, John Wayne Gacy, uh, Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was able to manipulate women. He was very good at it. Um, so your subgroup here of, of sociopaths or psychopaths, rather, um, remorseless predators who engage in violence. So a psychopath is engaging in violence that takes it further. They're very rare guys. Um, you know, they're, they're not as common as we think. Antisocial personality disorder, on the other hand, I think it's quite common. Some people speculate one in 25 people or one, you know, have tendencies um, of antisocial personality disorder. So uh, it's a concerning disorder. The uh, borderline personality disorder, um, pervasive pattern of instability, uh, marked by impulsivity, beginning in early adulthood, um, splitting, thinking style characterized by seeing the world in black and white terms. For example, they typically view people as either hated enemies with no positive qualities or beloved idealized friends who can do no wrong. And they can go – they can turn on that pretty quickly. They can idealize you, and then you can do something that hurts their feelings in a benign way, and they'll quickly turn on you. In fact, a great book that explains this is called I Hate You, Please Don't Leave Me. And it's really written to those who are in relationships with people who have borderline personality disorder. So uh, unstable affect, unstable sense of self and identity, including self-destructive impulsive behavior sometimes. Um, they're at higher risk for cutting, higher risk for self-harm, um, in treating and working with borderline personality disorder, um, higher risk for suicidal ideation and behavior. So it's you have to take a lot of care with this. Um, Negative interpersonal relationships are unstable, intense, characterized by extreme shifts between idealization and devaluating you. Self-harm, another, another issue there. Um, potential causes, biological childhood experiences, high rate of sexual abuse again, um, and also neglect. And they have a hard time trusting people. Um, a lot of times the way a borderline will behave in a relationship is they'll – it's a whirlwind at first. They want to be your best friend. They want to fall in love with you quick. They need you to love them very quickly. But then sometimes deep inside, they don't trust that you're going to stay with them. They don't trust that you're going to um, come through on promises. So sometimes they'll push you away before um, – before you leave them because in their mind you're going to leave them like everybody else has left me so they'll do a preemptive strike and sometimes sabotage the relationship um, other times it's the push and pull they push you away they pull you in they push you away they pull you in and my heart goes out to people with borderline personality disorder guys because um, they want good relationships and and they're you listen they're talented fun loving kind of people but when you get in a personal relationship with them then you'll see the borderline tendencies come out and I think there's an identity issues. They sometimes struggle with truly knowing who they are. Um, there's trust relationship issues, no doubt. And it's not just up and down emotions. Your typical up and down emotions, no. They 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 dramatically change, and can do this very quickly. Um, I had a a person in therapy once who, when I started to kind of confront her gently on some issues, she quickly told me what a scum I was, one of the worst therapists in the world I was. Prior to that, she was, oh, I was the greatest thing ever, right? Not until I confronted her a little bit. And then she stormed out and cursed me out, basically. I get a call about three hours later. I'm so sorry. Can I come back? I'm so sorry. Can I come back? And I wasn't surprising. I'm like, if we can talk about what really got to you where you quickly split and quickly with your thinking and became very angry to that degree, then yeah, you know, well, let's let's continue. It's tough, though. A lot of therapists refer clients with borderline personality disorder. And to work with them, you have to have specialized training. You have to know what you're doing, and a lot of therapists don't. Um, they really need good, skilled um, therapists that, that are trained in the modalities that have been proven to help. And there are some modalities. There are some treatments that can help borderline, but it's a, it's a big commitment, and it takes a long time. 
uh, stigma. I, I don't have time to go into this, but I want you to read about the Rosenheim study. Really interesting stuff on, on once we diagnose people, how we view them, and and overcoming the stigmas that's attached with it. Because I'm I'm very I don't like labeling. I don't like stigmatizing, and it's a, it's a problem in mental.